oceans of water were pushed over the dunes. Waves behind me churning up terribly. Major flooding across our area. Three deaths, 72 water rescues. Just about everything's gone. Big pieces of sheet metal just flying by us. Get safe right now. This is a powerful storm that can kill. Pushing water 10 feet high in some places. It's been a creeping death. You can see that the car is still stranded. This is an area devastated by Floyd and Matthew. I remember Matthew two years ago, and here we go. Back to you. Six years after Matthew and four years after Florence, thousands of people are still waiting to go home. It's been six years. Six years. No North Carolinian should be living in a home infested with mold or with a tarp for a roof. The story is that Rebuild North Carolina has bungled this program, left thousands of people homeless who are hurricane survivors who've already sustained incredible trauma and no one is helping them. We stayed in this condition at least five years. There have been times I wanted to go away. I had thought about suicide. <laughs> I've been hurt so bad. My, and then to see my wife going through like she is, it's painful. I thought, this is thousands of people. Thousands of people that no one knows about. Because you think, well, Hurricane Matthew, that's in 2016. Hurricane Florence, that's in 2018. Years have passed. They are completely forgotten. Nobody even knew that they were living in motels. This had all flown under the radar. This is how I have to live. And nobody can seem to understand what, how, oh gosh, this is so devastating. It's just, I, I just cannot believe that I've been stuck here three years. Why? Why is it taking this long? epic failure of bureaucrats. That's how it happens. It's incompetence. And ultimately, I think there's no one being held accountable. My name is Laura Hogshead, and I'm the director of NCOR. This recovery is not going as you want it to go, and that is on me. Why haven't you resigned? That's a great question. Should Laura Hogshead have that job? No, absolutely not. Of course not. She has no business sitting in that position. How does she still have that job? We'll have to ask Governor Cooper that question. Governor Cooper, are these people a priority? You have not been forgotten. You will never be forgotten. But you have the same people in charge. You haven't made any changes at the top. Look, I, I understand how they don't have trust in the rebuild program anymore. We have people that left their house after Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Matthew and never came back home. They died in a hotel or died with family. It's unacceptable. I asked him, I said, what are y'all doing waiting on us to die so you can leave everything undone? They never answered, never responded. Willie and Geraldine Williams moved out of their hurricane-damaged home in Aden in 2019. It's so depressing. It's very it's so depressing. depressing. Yeah, I mean, even when I'm in the hotel room, just thinking about yeah. it, it's depressing. And, and it affects him more than it does me, because he, he actually cries about it. It affects me a lot. Rebuild NC, a state program in charge of nearly 800 million federal dollars, taxpayer dollars, meant to help low-income hurricane victims was supposed to repair it. Crews removed the bricks and front porch in 2021 and left the home like this. I have no homestead no more. They took it away. We could have lived here just like it was before they came in here and destroyed it. We could have lived here probably the rest of our life yeah. as it were. Willie, a retired veteran, and Geraldine, who ran a nursing home and then a daycare, have lived in a hotel ever since. Nearly three years in one room, waiting on answers from Rebuild. 
And I, I tell my husband, we, thank God we know how to survive, but we didn't anticipate this. Last time you saw me, I was emotional. I don't went from emotional to pure mad. I mean, mad. Oh, how much they just don't know. <sighs> Willie had a massive heart attack last year and is starting chemo. Geraldine is on dialysis. Yes, 10 hours every day after dialysis. In a hotel. In a hotel. And they bring me about 35 boxes of supplies every month that has to sit in my, in my one hotel room. They have no way to make meals. I'm a person who loves to cook. I have no stove in the hotel. I have no refrigerator in the hotel. I have acquired everything I wanted in my life to be able to live a comfortable life, and I have access to none of it. Absolutely none of it. It's just ridiculous. All of their items have been stored in these pods. All of the rat droppings and everything. Rebuilt sent the pods. You put all your stuff in there. Mm -hmm. They said three months. Mm -hmm. It's been three years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just saw what was in the pods. Mm -hmm. uh, is it all damaged? Probably most of it, yes. So. I mean, it's I'm, rat infested. Rebuild NC has spent $13 million on hotels, motels, and pods since the program started in 2019. It's called temporary relocation assistance. For some, the months have turned into years, and sometimes the bill isn't even paid. Every two or three weeks we go to our room, we're locked out <laughs> because they have not repaid for the next day. They only update our stay for like three weeks at the time. Are they coming? They said they would. Okay. Some homeowners in the program have reached out to lawmakers begging for help. We're actually going through list by list to make sure that they've got the services that they, that they were, were promised, first of all. I've had one homeowner that's been in a hotel since 2017 who's been diagnosed with cancer. I've got a homeowner robbed multiple times while living in that hotel. And I've got people that aren't in houses back in their homes over 700 days. When I've talked to them, they said, I just want to sleep in my bed. I just want to cook in my kitchen. I don't want to be in a hotel anymore. People are spending 20 months, close to three years, some folks in these motels. I don't know, they just come and told us that we had to get out. Wow. Lisa Sorg is a veteran investigative reporter with NC Policy Watch. She first reported on the program's failures and all the people left behind in spring of 2022. I have been a reporter for 28 years in three states. This is the worst case of bureaucratic madness I have ever seen. Just 20% of the nearly 4,200 homes in the program are done. That means more than 3,300 are left. It's just unbelievable. The thing that will stick with me about this story forever is the sound of people speaking and relating to you. We were homeless. My house was falling apart. I couldn't get an answer. My emotional support animal died in the motel. Everything that I've ever loved has been taken from me. These are the things I have heard. And I have to say, it, it takes its toll. Y'all yeah, don't know. I just, if it weren't for God, I don't know. Franklin Jones and his wife, Roberta, lived in their mobile home in Dudley for 28 years. It was damaged by Matthew, then Florence. It started with Matthew, then it got bigger. They signed up with Rebuild in 2019. They were supposed to get a home in January of 2020. This ain't nothing but a mobile home. You can come in, it's on wheels, and, and snatch it out. That never happened. While they waited, they lived in their damaged home, trying to make repairs. But that's not allowed under the program, and the conditions inside the home were unsafe. This place paid for. All I was asking was somebody to help me fix it up when the money was released. But they came and said the house wasn't repairable. The state moved the family into a motel in March of 2021. But then after we moved out, we all us caught COVID living in a hotel with just one bedroom. And that was me, my wife, and my daughter and her daughter. Roberta has been on oxygen since she caught COVID and they've been in that motel 
more than 20 months. It's very frustrating not having anywhere to go and living here in this hotel in this one room. Now that's depressing. Everything they owned stored in pods behind the place they do anything to return to. I mean, to be 68 years old, I never, I never asked for help. I, I, I retired from a job. I worked nearly 50 years, and here I am. Now, I need, when I need help, I want somebody to respond and not wait four or five years. Oh my God, I had to fall in this trap. <laughs> I felt like I was going to try it. Rena Powell has been living in a motel for almost a year. She's been waiting on answers and a new home from Rebuild after hers was damaged in both storms. Every day, every day except Sunday. With nothing to do, she visits her old home in Marmac to check on the place and get the mail. I am bored to death in that motel. I'd rather be here and I have thought about just coming and moving back in just like it is. And they take my stuff and put right back in here. That's the way I feel. Viola Rouse Figueroa has been waiting on rebuild to rebuild their home in Goldsboro since 2019 for her, her husband, and 77-year-old mother. Hell, it's been a nightmare. She's been living in a trailer right next to where her new home should be since Matthew hit. My husband passed away in the FEMA trailer that I was forced to buy. She worries about her mom. I do not want to be a person that says, I wish my mom could have lived to see her house. People have died before they've gotten back in their homes. At least 10, at least 10 people have died because of the delays. My sister had applied for the program. Her and her husband have both died since and neither one never got through, so the kids just left it alone. Both of them have died. Coming up. My daddy's passed. I now have lung cancer myself. I just want to go home. I promised my daddy that I would get back home. I've asked him, what are you waiting for me to die? I think that this team that we have built is the right team to carry the project forward. This team has failed based on everyone's standards. Like, this team has failed thus far. So why keep this same team? I mean, I can't help from crying sometimes. The family's still waiting for answers after Hurricanes Matthew and Florence feel as abandoned as the homes they had to leave. That frustration has turned into anger at the people in charge. It is always hard to hear what a family is going through. There is a plan in place. I say this because I'm a vet. It starts up top and come down. Hey, hey guys. Hi, guys. Oh, hi. How are you? How are you? Governor Roy Cooper created the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency, or NCOR, in 2018. It was after the state had problems spending federal money from the storms. NCOR runs the Rebuild NC program. Are you proud of this program? Do, do you think it's been a success thus far? I think overall the recovery in the state has been successful. I think for these several thousand homeowners, those who are in it and those who have gotten their homes would feel good about it, although it took too long. But I'd say overall, the, the combination of the state federal program has not been successful because it has been too slow and it needs to speed up. Rebuild has received nearly 800 million federal dollars to help get low income people without insurance back home. There are nearly 4,200 applicants. Rebuild's most recent numbers show 3,300 homes still aren't done. But I would say to this, Governor Cooper and the rest of the team up there in Raleigh that has a part in this, I wish y'all would do a follow-up much closer and check the situation people are living in. It's just not fair. He's a good man. 
he's a good governor, but personally, he has done nothing for my family. I'm a proud Democrat, but at this point, it's not about politics. It's about the basic need of humans. Today, we still have people displaced, stuck, and waiting for assistance. House Majority Leader Republican John Bell represents Green, Johnston, and Wayne counties. The governor's office has a tremendous amount of blame in this process. It's his administration that has failed the people, but we've got to put politics aside and fix this. We may end up doing that. Republican State Senator Danny Britt represents Robinson County. This isn't an election year issue that we're, you know, saying NC Rebuild isn't doing anything right, the Cooper administration isn't doing anything right. These are issues that we raised to the media that we raised with citizens back in 2017 and in 2018, that, that the government is simply moving too slowly. I would like for us to get started. Britt and Bell are part of a 12-member legislative committee investigating rebuild. The committee held a six-hour hearing in September. We should have had action earlier in these policy yes. changes. We heard from victims. It's not about us being angry. It's about us being not heard, not heard. I just want to go home. I promised my daddy that I would get back home. I've asked him, what are you waiting for me to die? Experts like J.R. Sanderson testified. You ain't got nowhere to go but up. He ran one of the most successful disaster recovery programs in the country in South Carolina before leaving to work for a nonprofit. He rated North Carolina's action plan for Matthew in 2016 an F. A lot of these problems could have been solved after Hurricane Matthew in 2016 and not allowed to grow and grow and grow and grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where you have a public outcry on it. My name is Laura Hogshead and I'm the director of NCOR. We also heard also from Laura Hogshead and her County chief and program delivery officer, Ivan Duncan. Hogshead has been in charge of NCOR since late 2018. She hired Duncan as her number two in 2019 from New York after Superstorm Sandy. How successful do you think you've been here? Well, we started out very well, and due to the pandemic, yes, it has slowed. I got sick and tired of hearing COVID, COVID, COVID. And my question was, is, okay, I understand, but what happened to two and three years before COVID? And they can't give you an answer. While Hogshead blamed complicated HUD rules, COVID, and other pandemic problems for some of the delays, she also said this. This recovery is not going as you want it to go. It is not going as I want it to go. It is certainly not going as the family sitting behind me and out in eastern North Carolina want it to go. And that is on me. And I am not in any way shirking that responsibility. These are my decisions. These are my staffing decisions. These are my policy decisions. And that is on me. I asked her about that statement during a sit down interview in the rebuild offices. And so if this is on you and you said that and you believe that, then why haven't you resigned? It's a great question because I believe that this is the right team to complete the mission. It's a decision making process that we make as a team in coordination with all of our stakeholders. I don't think that interrupting the recovery to replace the senior leadership here is the right move for the applicants. I didn't feel like making an abrupt change at this point was going to help applicants and that really is the core of every decision that we make. While Hogshead was prepared for the resignation question, NCOR's Chief of External Affairs, Jamie Fuquay, was not. She was also in the room for the interview. You'll hear her talking off camera. So that, I think that's just, it's, it's just not sitting well with me um, in terms of, it's not like Laura saying, no, I will not resign because right. no one has asked for that. Right. Well, and she's free to say that. I think all the people we talk to, homeowners, experts, people who've done your job, I point blank ask them, if this was your program, if these were your numbers, would you resign? And they said, yes, without a doubt. Would you stay in the job? Would you resign? Oh, yeah. You would resign? Well, I mean, I would because I'm, that's just the way I look at the world. I'm not one to uh, embrace failure. <laughs> I do think that's a failure. So, it may, you know, with all due respect, it may not sit well with you, but that is what, that's what people that we interview, mm -hmm. that's what they're wondering. Hogshead said several times in the interview, she is the right person with the right team behind her. I think that this team that we have built is the right team to carry the project forward. And I think every person is the right person to make the changes that need to happen. But days after that interview, Ivan Duncan, the man she hired, who testified by her side, resigned. 
Encor, said the deputy program delivery officer will be named acting chief and there will be no disruption of services. Hogshead and others said this is a very complicated process. I want to say that this is difficult and this is something the state has never done before. So this is not like the FEMA assistance that comes in when it's still raining and writes you a check that is not full recovery and then walks away. This is the long-term recovery for the most vulnerable folks. She said Rebuild has made changes. They are streamlining the eight-step process to get into a home, bringing on more contractors, and the biggest change, bringing case management in-house. One of the biggest complaints about Rebuild is that homeowners could not get answers. I have had over 69, 74 case managers, yeah. I would say every homeowner I've spoken with has said, I can't get a hold of my case manager. I can't get a hold of my construction liaison. I get different phone numbers. I call people back. They don't call me. They get the runaround. Rebuild blames a third party contractor in charge of the case management, Horn, for that. Horn blames Rebuild for an unorganized program and leaders who did not listen to their suggestions. Homeowners weren't told what was going on. That was so, I can't imagine how frustrating, I, I did not know that. Governor Cooper received weekly updates about Rebuild and said it's his top priority, but said he was unaware. And so you're saying you didn't know about the case management, but isn't it your job to know? Well, well look, I, I think it's important that people know that what's happening with their homes and the, the rebuild. And that's why when we started finding this out, we said, you got to change it. And I think the rebuild understood they needed to change the way they were doing things. Because I don't even think rebuild knew because they were depending on a third party vendor to do that job. Okay. So they should have. So I think we were too reliant on vendors before. We are now running this as a state program. And we are working every day to make sure this is streamlined as possible, that the communication is as clear as possible, and that we get to completion. Because really the only thing that matters is getting the keys in that homeowner's hand. Who can fix that? But for some homeowners and lawmakers, these changes came too late. And, and why didn't we make those changes? And why did we only start making changes six months <laughs> ago when things were beginning to be highlighted? Fighting them all. There's no reason why she's making $139,000 and not getting the job done. She's been proven, in my opinion, to be too ineffective to remain in that position. If she was my employee in the private sector and her outputs were what her outputs are in the public sector, she would have been fired a long time ago. Next. Disaster recovery in North Carolina is broke. Shattered, in my opinion. Rebuild must face lawmakers again. For somebody to go through this type of stuff, and I know I'm not the only one. The Williams and other families are left in limbo. Hoping answers might finally come after another legislative hearing in December. So there's another hearing in December, December 14th. What do you hope happens? What are you going to call for? We implemented a number of changes. I'm going to call for the removal of Hogshead and a complete revamp of the agency. I think at this point, what should happen is that Rebuild is so broken that it's going to need a complete renovation. The more you get out and you get the, what I call the mud smell, the mold smell in your, in your nose, the more you realize you got to work faster. The only way to do this is to build trust. If the citizen doesn't trust me, then I'm failing. I'm failing as a bureaucrat. I'm failing as a public administrator. Sanderson, they need about 15 of them. He spoke nothing but the truth. They need to get rid of the ones that are up there now. They do. But we've got to change it from a legislative standpoint so this doesn't happen again. I hope that we're able to show much better numbers and that we're able to show that our output is increasing and that that output is sustainable. What if you're not? I have confidence that we will be able to. So what happens? What happens if they don't make progress? Well, this is what I expect. I expect it to happen. And I think knowing that we're going back on the 14th of December is another way of making me feel like they're going to get off their behinds and try and do something. Will you stop fighting? Of course not. Even I after I get in my home, I'm not going to stop fighting. 
because there's too many other people out there it's too much going to through this. It leaves you speechless because you feel like the system has failed. I hope someday there will be a change. I'm just holding on by faith, trusting God that it will.